welcome folks thank you all for coming here on the talk you probably were a bit dicey about like like uh Brigitte here is saying and indeed this is a talk about details that we thought you didn't need but here we all are anyways so before going into it so i'll probably describe myself yet again i haven't changed from the dress that i was in before the still in the red uh, red shirt here and still the long hair and hopefully the same same sunny berlin as well i'm not sure how long, how long it's gonna run here anupriya maybe you want to go uh, hello everyone i'm anupriya i'm from the london office and definitely we have more sun um i'm wearing a black thoughtful t-shirt and i have shoulder length hair definitely longer than rahul <laughs> Uh, given enough pandemic time, I'll catch up with it. All right, so welcome to the talks again. Uh, and before we uh, uh, go into the thing, Anupriya here has a story to share with us. Okay, so uh, this is uh, me in Portugal. I did the underwater sea diving and I saw the wonderful creatures inside the ocean. And it was a great adventure. And I have a dream that the future generations have this adventure even in the future. They are able to relish the wonderful flora and fauna inside the oceans. But there is a bit of a problem. There are some companies who use the ocean water near the poles to cool down their data center centers. This is good because we are not using any external measures for the cooling, but it is a bit not so friendly for the environment. And Maybe someone might recognize the thing, but yeah, I mean, I guess that's why they're part of the Rust Software Foundation. They seem to be using a lot of Rust here, All right? But moving on, uh, what uh, what effect does it indeed have on, on our environment? Like so, so many data centers, maybe. Yes, uh, so because of this, uh, the ice on the poles, that's melting down and we are having reduced uh, polar ice caps and the levels of the oceans and the temperature of the oceans is rising. Now, there is another problem which is associated with it. Uh, at certain depths and certain temperatures, certain flora and fauna in the ocean can exist. Now, since these temperatures and uh, levels are changing, these flora and fauna are dying. So we are having reduced ocean diversity. Now, I have a question. What can we as software engineers do so that we are able to save our oceans, keep the temperature as it is, so that the future generations can enjoy the adventure that I had. Right, so before knowing what we can do and learn more about it, so we learn a more bit about ourselves as well. And as you can kind of see, like we're doing a talk in a talk, if you can think about it. So Anupriya here is a more resident JVM Java expert here, seeing a lot of, lot of, uh, a lot of experiences with the J J writing Java code, I would say. A lot of ex enterprise experience, and I'm not sure how much how much of it is actual happy experience. But I'll I'll leave you up, uh, leave not not open that door probably. But uh, I guess that's why we are here. Uh, and me, on the other hand, I carry a bit more experience on the infrastructure side, running the JVM from in in a lot of perspectives and a lot of things. And I personally am quite. Uh, interested in how things work, the unnecessary details and the premature optimizations, if you can call it that, right? So yeah, both we are both of us are friends and colleagues from ThoughtWorks. Anupriya goes with Anupriya Joe. I go by Speak Louds, and I'm here to do the talk in a talk, right? So, but before that, uh, what, why do you think it's it's important for us to know about these details and maybe some excerpts from our experience here? Yeah, so I think I got exposed to writing as back as Java 6 in some of the core environments such as banking and manufacturing. And first I thought that I understood Java, but later on, I now think that I understand the IntelliJ more thanks to the debug pointers. Uh, being exposed to Java from the very early on, I had this curiosity of trying to see what happens in the JVM. And after going through it, I think I was able to write a bit more efficient code by paying attention to certain aspects. Uh, the JVM is also coming up with a lot of new features which we can get exposed to while we are going through the talk. Uh, and while having better efficiency code, I think I was able to help in letting the temperatures of the ocean lesser. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's try to understand that why we chose Java, which will have a major impact on controlling the water temperatures 
mm-hmm. and go on a journey both in tech and places right and before that we also like to know who can do a better dance here like this so before that let's know let's see what the current state is why are we making this let's say insinuation like knowing about java and then that somehow lets us control the global temperature so by the looks of it the jvm not only warming up our rooms our laps our desktops our intelligences and the servers as well it seems to be warming up the world as well because that seems to be the largest uh, thing to be used in all the places right and if we know how we can control these things or by knowing a bit more details about it we may be able to write a bit more efficient code that's our hope here that there is a bigger reason for us to write better java than just just write better java okay so at some point or the other people who have who are here who have done java has come across this thing at some point in their lives i guess if not all of us right and a lot of devices run java that's a good or a bad thing again i'll leave it up to you um but i'm not sure what's wrong but doesn't matter when we install java it's always those 3 billion devices on java so again what's wrong i have no idea maybe someone can educate me there as well but let's focus on a problem that maybe we could solve right and anupriya here might have a analogy that might help us relate to the problem a bit more yes so one of the things that i find good uh, as an example is driving driving as an abstraction so we all know that to drive a car we have to understand how the gears work how the wheels turn how the indicators work but if the car breaks down it will be great help if you know how the engine works or why a particular sound is coming from the car for a particular problem similarly if we have the jvm and the jvm breaks down we have a file called hs_err_pid.log which contains the jvm dump of the heap and thread when the jvm crashed and when we get this file we can see what what has gone wrong and what we can in the future pay attention to so that we don't have these errors also when we know the details of the engine or in this case the jvm we can enjoy small nuances like maybe at what gear i have to put the car when i'm driving uphill or what loop or what variable scope that i have to use when i'm writing a certain code so we can take like advantage of the nuances of the languages so to write more efficient code we should try understanding the depths of the jvm and this will definitely help us save the oceans to understand how the jvm work let's try to understand how do languages work right so how does our code run in the right so maybe we could look at them in two broad ways not not comparing the languages themselves but how they actually execute so languages like python ruby or something similar these are these are interpreted languages or they tend to be a bit more on the higher abstraction level the work here is actually done by the interpreter or the virtual machine right not the code that we write so code is interpreted and the execution is done by something else a rust go c c++ on the other hand they compile the code that we write and the code exactly executes as it is right so if you think about it uh, because of the one more layer of indirection for languages like python it is a bit slow but we have much more abstractions and ways of thinking about problems independent of the machine right rust on the other hand or c c++ they are quite close to the metal and They 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 tend to be quite imperative rather than declarative or maybe abstract, right? So both of them add add they give us immense speed. So both of them have their pros and cons, but let's see how all of this maps to the JVM, right? So as far as I understand, this is Java and Scala here. Yes. So this is the code for Hello World program in Java and Scala, mm-hmm. and this compiles to bytecode, which you can see one side of the screen. It is uh, Java bytecode and the Scala, and they both give the output as Hello World. okay so that's that's simple enough but i don't see assembly here as far as i understand things that compile to compile completely need to be assembly but i see some abstractions here it's not the code that we wrote but not assembly as well so is this compiled interpreted which is better maybe okay so to understand how the jvm works first we have to understand what is hot code so some examples of what type of code can be considered as a hot code is loops which run more than 10000 iterations or interpreted methods uh, after 200 invocations some partially compiled methods which have more than 5000 invocations or some type 
tiny methods which are frequently uh, frequently called. So yeah. now you have to understand these are the codes which are being called again and again, and therefore might be performance uh, creating a lot of performance hit. Mm -hmm. So now let's try and understand what is JVM. So JVM is the best of both worlds. It's called a hotspot VM or JVM's implementation uh, called JIT, just-in-time compiler. It only compiles the code when it is needed. So it consists of C1 and C2. So what happens, the bytecode, we know already how the bytecode comes into picture. Now the interpreter takes in the byte code and profiles the code for the hot codes that it has. And according to the thresholds that we can see on the screen, it can be a back edge threshold or a compiled threshold. It tells that next year that the code has to go for, for instance, in this, let's say we have a hello world program. So it will send it to the C1 compiler with no profiling. Similarly, and then the code comes back and with more threshold, it goes to C1 with limited profiling. Then it comes back with more profile code. And after a bit more time with more thresholds, it goes to C1 with full profiling. Now the code that comes back from C1 compiler is moderately faster. Given enough time though, if we send all this code to C2 compiler, it is very, very fast. It's one of the most efficient codes. So okay. interpreter keeps the track of the th thresholds before the bytecode is sent to the next tier. And every time it's being sent to the next tier, the profile code is sent back to the interpreter with better performance. Notable examples of such tiered uh, JIT are V8 powering the Chrome and the Node.js. Okay. There are certain times though when the JVM code has to get de-optimized and that has a severe performance penalty. These like examples of such de-optimizations can be reflection or if there are uncaught exceptions in the code or if the C1 and C2 compiler did some assumptions which were not found to be right. Therefore, we say do not use exceptions as control flow because every time we have to de-optimize the code, we are hit by 100 times more speed penalty. Right, so I guess that's why we have been cribbing about for the last 25 years that Java is slow, is it? Because we have to do all this fancy stuff in the beginning. And then, and then we are graduated to better things, apparently. Yes. So if you see on the screen, the graph in the green shows you the performance for the C1. It initially takes a bit of time and it gives us a moderately faster uh, code. But given enough time, if you see the blue part, that's the C2 compiler. It takes enough time, but then it gives one of the most uh, efficient codes. So I guess given enough time, everyone can improve, not just humans. Right? Yeah. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, the C1, C2, we are quite pieces of magic here. And we also seen a lot of places, Java code itself is legacy. So you can imagine how, how much legacy is the C1, C2 code. And the thing that actually runs our legacy is our. So, these are quite old, 26 year old recently, I think. And they are they, they're written in C, C++ or even lower assembly at places. Uh, and they come with the maintenance nightmare. Recent improvements, algorithms, better GC things. So these things are quite a challenge to put these things into such an aging dinosaur of a code basically. Right? To uh, code, uh, code Cliff Click, one of the creators, probably the creators of the JIT, whatever we learned from Anu here came from Cliff Click. Uh, among the other things, he said, I would not want to write a VM in C++ ever again. I want to write something in more abstract thing. so that it's not just me, but the people coming after me can do something about it as well, right? So how can the older generation here literally help the newer generation, right? So we can help each other to increase the performance of the JVM even more, right? So for that, uh, what happened as part of JDK 9 as Project Jigsaw, you're going to be hearing a lot of project this, project that in the top. Uh, Jigsaw split the JVM into things called modules. And we have this ability to plug and play our things now. And the thing to note, important thing to notice here is the compiler interface, which allows us to plug in our own implementation of the just in time compiler that we learned, right? So this has really nice implications. This has, has opened up a lot of doors for us in the future. So what could they be, maybe? Okay. So one of the things that we have in the future was the Graal VM. So Graal VM was made as a part of a separate project for enhancing the efficiency of the JVM. So initially the C2 was written in C and C++. Now as part of the Graal VM, C2 
uh, was written in Java. So now we as developers could use more complex and difficult algorithms, which created like way more efficient code with the C2 compiler. Mm -hmm. So there were some superpowers that the Graal VM had. So one is Truffle. Truffle is a framework or a set of API to parse the language. So let's say we have a new language. We tell the JVM how to create the abstract syntax tree using Truffle. And mm -hmm. Polyglot, Polyglot is a framework by Graal to load and interop between these languages. Mm -hmm. It enables and helps in switching of the languages when running. There was another one called Native Image. Native Image is ahead of the time compilation for Java bytecode from any language to a standalone executable. So instead of compiling at the very end, we'll make the whole compilation at the beginning. Is this the holy grail then? Like we should not be complaining anymore for the last, why Why we have been complaining so much? We should just com compile everything to Graal and then be done with it. Like, is this the whole solution to all the problems? So I would say it completely depends upon whether you need the sword or the knife to put butter on your toast. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have a problem of the linter where we need instant startup and slow down time. In that case, we'll use the native image, but let's say we have a server of the bank, which can take initial performance hit, but then it wants one of the most efficient codes, then we will use our plain JVM. So we have to be very, very careful while using these things, because in the beginning, the native image will consume a lot of energy. Right, okay. I guess, yeah, that's, we just move the warming from the end to the beginning, okay. So, one more thing that we want, uh, at least I am quite excited about is Project Loom. This is a reimagination of uh, the concurrency primitives in the JVM. So we we have been used to the fact that we have just threads to write parallel code, but they're quite heavy, as you can imagine, having their own heap and thread. So we can't really do much apart from having from two, a couple of thousands of them. So Loom implements virtual threads, which is a much lighter version of threads, or uh, things that are scheduled by the JVM onto threads instead of the OS. So you can now go ahead and write much more concurrent code and especially do blocking IO much easily as compared to threads. Right? So Project Valhalla, that's something that's coming up as well. This is a attempt to defragment the JVM heap. So a lot of us have been uh, faced with the problem that integers are quite big. A lot of us have learned like four bytes of int, but it's actually much more than that because it's an integer object. So Valhalla is an attempt to uh, treat these things as value types, like integers can be just raw ints or floats or characters. So we have much more compressed and natural heap sizes and we could be much better performance as well. Panama, that scales the JVM wall. By the wall, I mean, we can talk to things outside of the JVM. So this is a bit different from polyglot, what Anu was mentioning, but this is about us talking to native things. Like for example, machine learning library. Why is Python so famous in machine learning? Because of its ability to talk to native libraries and then we can write much more abstract code. Right? So Panama eases out this problem. We do have JNI, JNA, but they're quite some pain. People have used it. Right? Uh, so we want to scale that and make it much more simpler. Right? But what about the other thing, the thing that made us, got us onto the JVM boat all the way back in 1995? We are doing a lot of innovations, but we do produce a lot of garbage as well. So what about, what's the story with the garbage collector? So I would say like we were heating up the oceans and creating garbage for the oceans. Similarly, we were creating garbage for the JVM and heating that up. And I believe we need a robot to solve both of these problems. Mm -hmm. At least for the JVM, we have one. And this is called the garbage collector. Right. So in nineties, we were short of memory and the garbage collection became mainstream. So the machines could handle it better. To understand how garbage collection works, let's try understanding a classic garbage collection algorithm called mark sweep. So to understand mark sweep, we have to first understand what is reference counting. So let's say we have a memory location on the heap called A. If there are five variables which point to this A location, then the reference count for heap location A is five. Hmm. So let's go back to mark sweep now. So mark sweep occurs in two levels. The first is mark. During this, the mark goes to all the location in the heap and it reference counts all the heap locations. Mm -hmm. Then the sweep occurs. When the sweep occurs, all the memory locations, which has reference count as zero are mm -hmm. free. But mm -hmm. whenever the sweep occurs, the entire heap is frozen. Mm -hmm. And this is called as a GC pause or stop the world GC. Mm -hmm. Now to solve the problem of GC pauses, we 
wanted to reduce the process to parts of the heap. So we found out a statistical observation that most objects die young. So what we did was we took all the variables in the beginning when they were made and put it in a memory space called Eden. After a lot of GC cycles, whatever variables remain, we move them to the survivor space. And after some more GC cycles, we move them to the tenured space and then to the permanent space. Mm -hmm. This model was known as generational memory model. So now the parts of the heap and parts of the JVM were getting frozen and tenured was getting lesser GC pauses and permanent was having none. Static variables started in the permanent gen itself. So let's maybe you can share about the some of the new upcoming GC innovations that we have in the JVM Rahul. Right. So whatever we learned from Anu here, that's pretty much what the G1 garbage collector does. And behold, we have other garbage collectors in the JVM as well who, who knew about this. Right. So one of the things that Brigadier was mentioning, it is such a good default that we don't even know that there are more garbage collectors. <laughs> And so that's a kudos to the, uh, to the JVM developers. Uh, G1 does exactly that. Uh, and it also adds a concurrent garbage collection on top of it. So we can reduce the pauses even more. ZGC, zero GC, as far as I understand it, is an attempt to get the GC pauses as low as possible. Probably will never be zero, but we can try. Uh, that's there with JDK 11. Shenandoah, that's there with JDK 14. It's an it's a much more, uh, uh, much better innovation on the pause times even more so that we can move the concurrent pauses even to the Eden things and all the other phases as well. Right? So ZGC is really low pause time. Shenandoah scales really well with really big heaps. When I say big heaps, tens of terabytes of memory. Yes, we do have machines like that. And we need, we need to make sure the JVM can scale. Right? So, Special mention to ZGC here. Since JDK 16, we we have a guarantee of a sub millisecond pause time. Uh, so it doesn't matter the size of your heap. I'm not I'm not really sure like what's the max it can address, but it guarantees you a pause time that is less than one millisecond, regardless of your heap size. So that has a lot of implications. We can we can we can check it out later on as well, right? All I want to do is drive a car, right? So that's what we started with in the beginning. And you are telling me I need to be in the engine all the time. Is it? Is that? Is that what you're telling me? Can I just look at the fancy dashboards and lights and be happy with it? Yes. So people knew that they're as lazy people as you. And therefore, we have something for in-detail atomic view of things, which is called the JFR or the Java Flight Recorder. This yeah. is a tool to understand the performance of the JVM in a very visual way. And there are other tools as well like the visual VM. Uh, we can use the same JFR metrics for clouds and dashboards. And I believe like if we as software developers have a look on these things, maybe we found out place, places where we can actually make a difference by changing some scopes or using some threads and mm -hmm. actually help in cooling the oceans. Mm -hmm. Right, so a lot of information here, but one of the things that I at least want to show here is we haven't been talking in the air. So let's have a look at the source code of the JDK, people who thought that this was not too much details already. So the first thing that you notice here is all this words that is Loom, Valhalla, maybe something else that comes up Panama here. So we're going to focus on this JDK bit here. And the first thing you notice is how easy it is to navigate this thing. That's another kudos to the developers here. It's super easy for someone who has a basic understanding of source code, they can navigate this thing really easily. So source, and as we can see a lot of fragmented things, this is part of the JDK9 jigsaw here. Each of them is a module. And as Anu was saying, hotspot. So let's look in what's, what's in hotspot. So if you see, this is the right ones run anywhere part of the JVM. So we have a lot of OS CPU combinations here. And for example, Linux and x86, for example, that's a thing that a lot of us use. And we have specific C++ code for each volume. Yes, this is nasty C++, like we were mentioning before. So let's look at here. Here you can see bits of GCs here as well. But the most most of the thing that you can notice here in the share thing, that's exactly where we even see even more familiar things. The JFR is here. The JVMCI thing is here. The interpreter that Anu was talking about that does a lot of magic. That's here as well. Reason for our 25-year-old cribbing. That's pretty much that folder here. And the GC is here as well. So here you can see G1, Sendendo, and Z. They have their own implementations. 
Um, it's super easy to navigate these things. And here you can see the C1 code as well, right? So that's the first level, first year compiler. Okay? All of this is, is there, all the gory C++ is out there for you to consume. Okay? So that's that. So just to assure that we are saying something that's actually tangibly visible. Right? Right. So you are telling me here is all I've got to do is move some variables around and my horrible JVM performance is fixed. Is, is that so? I, I, am I, I, is my variable moving so powerful here? Is it? So I would say like uh, we see uh, 50 people on the call, let's assume it's 25 developers and we are writing code for like 20 years. Uh, yeah. If we all start paying attention to little things, we definitely can make some difference. So I learned this in the beautiful city of Hamburg that small tugboats can actually change the direction of big ships. Mm -hmm. So let's try it. Even if we can make a difference of one or 0.5 degrees, then why not? Okay. So I, I guess a lots of bucket can move an ocean, I guess. Yeah. That's a really yeah. <laughs> so some of the takeaways here, uh, we got a lot of information here, even with the source code. So think twice before you're going to put something in your static blocks, because as we learned that creates a lot of GC pressure uh, because they start in the permanent generation, right? lesser collections. ZGC here, that is for low latency for high frequency transaction kind of scenarios. A lot of uh, Java, J the JVM gets a lot of flack for not being fast enough. There is too much GC process, switch to the ZGC. You have solutions for it. GraalVM native again, use it for the thing that you actually want to use it for. That has actual fast startup times, dead on times, right? And please think twice before you want to compile your Spring Boot project to native. There's a lot of tutorials on it now, but think twice about it. That's, that's not what you may want, right? So that, and finally, to wrap it all up, uh, first measure what's wrong where. So 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, the problem is not the language. It's probably the way you have written it or the IO scenarios, right? So profile where the problem is mark your things and not trust micro benchmarks. That's not what the JVM was meant it for. It's for longer running things. So find your things, then try applying one of the things that you learned here, maybe, right? So with our friend Luca here, we really like the, love the green and blue dot that we're on. And we would like to keep the blue levels at the way, at the levels they are at right now, maybe, maybe not too much increase. So with that, we are hoping that with all this knowledge, you can write some more better efficient Java, catch these things even earlier, have a bit more intuition onto where things could be going wrong, right? And we can be happy as well, right? So Anupra and I, we thank you for this and hopefully you had some useful things listening out of it. Yes, too much details, but too much details is good at things. <laughs> so thank you, we are open for questions. I'm going to be the lone clapper here again, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Many details, yes, but you know that's what the that's what the title said basically, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there are some questions here already. The first one is from uh, somebody anonymous who's asking: Has Loom been used in production yet? So, unfortunately, not. Uh, it's it's something that still lives on a branch, and and it's it's available as early builds, or pretty much is there since every the last two or three releases, you can get it as an EA build and you can try it out. There have been a lot of demos on pretty much throwing like 20 year old code bases at, at Loom and it still just works <laughs> magically. So, but if you plan to use it, please do use it. That's quite useful for the JDK developers as well. And then uh, Meenakshi is asking what inspired you to do such an in-depth JVM research, maybe Anupriya. <laughs> uh, like, I think I was very fed up and uh, that's when we got into it. Like if we as developers are so fed up and every everything's changing, why we are still using it. And then I think I try to understand like what are the benefits and why it's slow in the beginning. So all those things led me to like go on this uh, research and eventually it turned out a talk. Uh, so thanks to the pairing that we had, Rahul and me, so. I guess enough frustration and writing code in anger helps. Yeah. Yes, 
definitely it helps in understanding like why why you want it it's usually sometimes a great approach to to learn as well right to say okay i'm going to do i'm going to put together a talk to explain something to other people that i don't know anything about yet right because then you really have to force yourself to see if you can explain it to somebody right yeah. i have a fun fact about that actually so brian Getz, who's obviously the java architect mm -hmm. that's i asked him once um how he came to know so much about concurrency to you know to, to be able to write the book on it and he said i didn't know anything about concurrency but i thought i'd write a book about it and then i learned all about it so yeah exactly that Nexus <laughs> next is the jvm book okay um, <laughs> yeah, the jar, yeah it's, you should you should right <laughs> Maybe some more like questions about the, the content to understand it a bit better. So um, Anupriya, you were talking about the tiered compilation, right? So why is it even tiered? Like, why doesn't it just all get compiled to on the C2 level? Yeah, so it depends upon what we are doing. So let's say we just have a hello, hello world program. So we, we don't have like 5,000 calls or like 2,000 invocations, all those things. And Therefore, we do not want that much time in providing. So C2 is going to take a way longer time. And therefore, we have this tiered architecture because now the interpreter will profile, okay, this doesn't have X, Y, and Z thresholds. So I'll just send it to C1 with no profiling and I'll get the assembly code back. So here we are saving on time. And that's why this is smarter because it knows and where to send it, how much time should I invest? So it's about the smarter investment in something. Mm -hmm. And then maybe about this this whole like craze about now compiling it uh, like about having native images and stuff like that. So is there like when you use that like are there any things that kind of get lost that we used to when we usually work with the JVM like the garbage collector, manage runtime things like that. Is there anything that's not there anymore if I go directly to native image? Right. So, we'll take this one. Yeah. So uh, the the thing that's so it's quite right. Of course, we can maintain everything there. So we do not have the exact hotspot there, but there's a thing called substrate VM. You can look look into that as well. So like the substrate that we have, another thing. So substrate VM is a is a minimized version of it, and what that does is it manages your thread. It still has a not so awesome GC, but still there is a GC there but all the thread management GC are still there and you, you can still write as managed code as you were doing in the normal JVM. There are some caveats there, but of course, like everything is not free. And I might've missed that. I might've missed that earlier. Maybe how you were saying kind of briefly mentioning at, at the end, like maybe think twice before you compile Spring Boot to a native image. Like, can you elaborate on that a little bit? I don't know if you talked about it earlier. I might've missed it. Right, so I uh, the idea there is Spring Boot manually, uh, sorry, generally is used for long running servers. And when you compile it to native, the obvious thing that you'll lose here is the, the just-in-time compiler that, that Anu was mentioning, that all the tiered fancy things. Right? So we won't get the runtime optimizations that, that you expect out of a JVM. So you would see in really good startup, but then the amount of time spent in number crunching is much higher on the native image. So it's the same the true for any ahead of time compilers like Rust or C, C++. That's where the JVM shines, longer running things. Okay. And then finally about that maybe, and maybe that's already been mentioned now with my previous questions, but like, then what is the, the difference or like how much better is the Graal VM just in time compilation in comparison to the hotspot? One. So I will I will send out a link here as well, and I'll maybe uh, attend these. Okay, so so that's a link here, and maybe I'll just quickly share my screen. So there are some uh, examples on this link, which which talks about running like a bit of contrived examples on both the JVM and the Graal's JIT, the C the C2 in Java. So normally when you run with Graal's JIT, the one that Anupriya told us about. So that goes all the way down here with successive runs for the warm up. But if you see, if you disable the one, so you see it's not that great of a story here. Okay. So again, a bunch of examples like this is a rendering engine that we have. And again, there is consistent decrease in, in, in uh, run times when you use the Graal's jet instead of the hotspot jet. Right? So this is production ready. Please use it. And if any case that you find that it's slower than the hotspot, it's a bug for the Graal team. 
they consider it that seriously. So please use it is as production ready as, as it can be.